Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with David Wood about why playing it safe is the most dangerous thing you can do. David Wood, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. I feel welcomed. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from LA. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about why playing it safe is the most dangerous thing you can do. Now, clearly that's a counterintuitive kind of a notion, um, but that's where the wisdom lies. Uh, and, And we see that in paradox all the time in the world around us. Uh, and we have these tensions all around us. And ultimately, we have to learn how to lean into the uncertainty, embrace the messiness and the complexity. And when we can do that, I think that's where we can really start to have productive, fulfilling lives. So today, we're going to talk specifically about playing it safe and and avoiding playing it safe uh, so that we can live our fullest, best life and and find meaning and purpose. As we get started, I wanted to share David's bio with everybody. David Wood is a former consulting actuary to Fortune 100 companies, he built the world's largest coaching business, becoming number one on Google for life coaching and coaching thousands of hours in 12 countries around the globe. As well as helping others, David is no stranger to overcoming challenges himself, having survived a full collapse of his paraglider and a fractured spine. That sounds horrendous. Uh, Witnessing the death of his sister at age seven, that's even worse, and anxiety and depression and a national gong show. He coaches high-performing business owners to double revenue and their time off by focusing on less and being 30% more courageous in their business or career. Uh, Tremendous background. My hat's off to you and my condolences to you uh, for those losses. Um, But like you said, you you learn, you grow from from these setbacks and it hopefully makes you even better, even stronger. it's a pleasure to be with you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the topic for conversation? Well, hearing th- that intro, your intro, I, it came to me in a different way, the, the origin story of David Wood and like why I'm doing what I'm doing. I think one thing that makes me uh, a, a different kind of human is that firstly, I shut down my emotions as a kid due to the, the trauma and tragedy that, that happened. And so I've then learned over time how to reclaim those, how to reclaim my truth and authenticity. And I also went into actuarial science. So I am the person to look at risk when it comes to a life decision or a business decision. Probability was my profession. And I actually apply that now to emotional intelligence. And I've never said that on 300 interviews, but it just occurred to me today we're going to talk about why playing it safe is the most dangerous thing you can do. And we're going to talk about it in the context of your relationships at work and at home. And I'm excited to make that connection in a way I haven't before. Yeah, well, that's great. And I should note for anyone watching the video, you can see uh, David's book uh, in on the screen behind him and and that's being launched and and being released very, very soon. Um, and it, it covers this very same topic. So perhaps you can just very quickly uh, give us an overview of the book uh, and tell us, you know, why this book, why now? Uh, and then we can dive more, dive on in more. Thank you. Yeah. And at the time of listening, if you're listening to it now, it's been released. 
So it's, it's available now. Um, you know, it's, it's, it started because I, I wasn't raised to check in with my feelings. I wasn't raised. No one said to me, David, we're not going to the zoo now. And we were going to go. How do you feel about that? Where do you notice that in your body? Are you feel angry? That makes sense to me. You know, say more about that. You want to beat a pillow? That wasn't my upbringing. And most humans didn't have that. You got in, got in trouble if you were angry or you got maybe got in trouble if you were crying. So we've learned all this conditioning to squish down anything that might be awkward. If I felt betrayed by you, uh, I might I might just not say anything about it and I'll just suck it up and deal with it. If someone's late to a meeting and maybe they're a colleague or above me in the hierarchy, maybe I'm not going to say anything because it's just going to be awkward. So I had a lifetime of that. And then fortunately, I discovered coaching back in 96. And I got coaching and I've sat with teachers and gurus. And I've been encouraged time and time again to discover what's actually going on. Okay, you don't like that person. Okay, you're not feeling good about what just happened. What is it? And so I decided I, I have to write a book because every time I did this, well, not every time, let's say nine times out of 10, life got better. Whenever I went and named something awkward with someone and had that conversation, shared a desire or a toleration, life got better, work got better. So I thought I have to write something about it. It wasn't until someone came into a class one day and said, you've just got to name the thing. And we're like, okay. And she said, you've just got to name the thing. Like, what are you talking about? She said, the thing that's in the room, the thing that's between you, it might be a feeling or a thought or a body sensation. You've just got to name it. So the person is clued in to who you are and then everything changes. And so I've, for a year or two, I thought, I got to write a book called Name That Thing. But then I thought, what do we have in society that's similar to this? Like, what do we already relate to? The elephant in the room. You see it. I see it. No one's saying anything. So I could have written a book called Address the Elephant in the Room. But so many creatures are much more subtle. Maybe I'm feeling it. I have no idea if you're feeling it or if you're aware of it. That's a mouse. So the title of the book is mouse in the room because the elephant isn't alone. I love it. I love it. And I love, I love hearing the origin stories of books and other uh, big life changes and, and directions that people take. Uh, I think that's, that's a really uh, great introduction to, to the rest of what we're going to be discussing together today. So with that in mind, and I do encourage listeners to, to reach out and to, to check out the book, Let's talk more specifically about this whole idea around playing it safe. What If playing yeah. it safe is actually the most dangerous thing, well, then why do we do it? I mean, most people tend to gravitate towards playing it safe. Uh, yeah. that, I mean, maybe it's hardwired into us. It's human nature. Um, we're socialized that way. Like what, what are all the reasons behind why playing it safe is a thing? And then we can start to pull it apart and realize how we can counteract that. Well, we're terrible. Most humans are really bad at their risk assessment. So we take bad risks and then we don't take the good risks. Bad risks are driving without a seatbelt. It's stupid. Stop doing it. There's very little upside and the downside is incredible. Smoking cigarettes, most of us know now that the downside is huge. The upside, okay, there is upside to smoking but you might be able to get that from something else. It's not going to kill you slowly. So we take these terrible risks, texting while you drive, huge risk. Tell me if this could be you. It's nighttime. So that's a risk factor. It's raining lightly. So that's a risk factor. And you just got a text message and you glance at it. Most people aren't even aware what that actually does to your chances of living. So we take bad risks, but the good risks, like sharing your truth, like saying to someone, hey, this isn't 
working for me. Can we talk about it and find something else? Or, you know, I have some feelings coming up. I notice I'm feeling some upset and I'd like to clear it so I can feel closer to you or so we can work together better. Those risks, many of us are not taking. We just say, no, too much. Now, here are the reasons why I think we play it safe when it comes to that. One, we're not totally clear on what's happening for us. If you just know you don't like it, that's not really enough to go to somebody. So we don't have the self-awareness to know what our mice are. In the book, I outline eight different categories of mice. You've got your desire mice. You've got your toleration mice. And there's a worksheet to help you get clear. So that's one reason. Another reason, we, want to feel com- we don't want to feel awkward in our body. It just doesn't feel very good. So often we'll gravitate towards comfort, but here's the trick. You can choose the discomfort of wearing a mask or the discomfort of sharing your truth. One of these has much greater upside. Wouldn't it be better to like just name it and then see what happens in connection uh, versus putting up with something for weeks or months or years? Here's another reason people don't name their mice no roadmap. If you do it incorrectly, you go to, here's, a, here's a way not to do it. I'm pissed. We need to talk. That's not how to do it. Or just blurting out stuff left, right, and center without regard for the impact it's going to have. That's not how to do it. So if you don't have a roadmap, of course, you might be hiding a lot of your mice. I outline a 3D process. We call it the, th- the 3D process in the book. And the first D is for Discover, discover your mice, decide if it's one worth naming and then disarm the other person. And there's a process for how to disarm someone so that they're like, oh, oh yeah, what have you got? And they're ready to listen. They they don't have their back up and they're ready to just jump in and defend straight away. I think that's great. And as you were mentioning some of those reasons and the comfort component, you know, again, I think we're hardwired largely. It's human nature that we want we, we like sameness, we like comfort, we, we want at least to have the sense of certainty or some level of control in our lives, even if it's a facade, we, we tend to gravitate towards that. Yeah. Um, and, and because of all of that, many people are also trained from a young age, if they are told or taught how to like to be in tune to themselves, in my experience, at least, almost all of that conversation for me as a child and as a teenager was if you're uncomfortable with something you should like that's that's something to avoid you should run from it you you should you know so if you're experiencing cognitive dissonance around an uncomfortable truth or or you're you're experiencing difference in a in a way that you've never experienced before and it makes you uncomfortable because it challenges your way of understanding the world or whatever you know like a lot of people are actually uh, socialized to, to recognize that, to label it and say, that's bad. I need to avoid it. I need to retreat back to safety. And that is, is just one additional, um, component, you know, to why so many people tend to just play it safe. Uh, and then when we're playing it safe, you have motivated reasoning and you have confirmation bias and you have these other biases that come into play that reinforce that, Oh, my choice was a good choice look at me now I'm safe now I'm comfortable. Um, and, and now I can point to all the reasons, you know, that I think, uh, that will reinforce my, my feeling that I made the right decision, uh, instead of pushing, challenging, uh, the status quo, challenging my understanding, uh, I, I, you tend to revert into yourself. And, and I, I think that's something that we need to be careful of and to break down as well. Yeah. Well, I want to jump on a couple of those topics. So we've gotten so comfortable I don't know what it was like 200 years ago, but I imagine it was harder. You know, now we've gotten to the point if the, pl- if the chair doesn't go back far enough in the plane, if it doesn't recline, we're pissed. And it's, you know, this was, was it CK Lewis, Louis CK, whatever, was saying, you know, you're, you're so annoyed because your email's loading slowly. It's bouncing off a satellite in space. And it's like, oh, this internet's so slow. We've gotten so comfortable. Our bubble's gotten so tight. And the risk is regret. The risk is regret. I started writing down some, some, some of the things that happen when we don't show ourselves. We, don't, we miss an opportunity to be seen and known. 
and we crave that. Jack Canfield wrote a wonderful forward to the book and it, it, it starts with, we crave to be seen and known. And yet if we don't share our truth, that can't happen. So I just made up this an acronym in the last minute, MCO, misconnection opportunities. Whenever you just skip over what's happening for you, you're missing a chance for the other person to connect with you over what's real. Now, yeah, it's going to be plenty awkward. If it wasn't plenty awkward, I wouldn't have to write a book about it. And, and they're not always going to be awkward. That's the, the other thing. The mind blows it up into something big. When you actually go and name it with someone, you, they may be like, oh, yeah, me too. And it's like, oh, my God, why, why did I blow it up? But you've also pointed to something else. More discomfort equals more value. If it's something that's easy, then there may not be a lot of growth opportunity there or connection opportunity. If it's actually vulnerable and you are revealing something and it's uncomfortable and awkward, then the value uh, in terms of growth is enormous. And the chance for the other person to go, oh, wow, I didn't realize that that's what was going on for you. Um, the chance for them to connect with you goes through the roof. So it's a game changer. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro-credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Yeah, yeah. And so far, we've been talking about this largely from an individual perspective, which I think is very important. But if we now apply it within a workplace setting in an organizational context, we, we see this play out all the time too. Organizations uh, who take appropriate risks versus those that are trying to play it safe and end up boxing themselves out of the competitive marketplace. They, they don't innovate, they don't add value uh, to the consumers. Um, so they see you know, their market share decline, their revenue decline, all that kind of stuff. So playing it safe in the world of work and, and in business is a dangerous prospect. Playing it safe within an organizational context, when we're talking about, you know, various dynamics around organizational culture and team dynamics and those sorts of things, that can be a very dangerous prospect. Um, what can I do as a leader? If I recognize, like for me, for my personal life, for my career, my own development and growth, I need to, to move away from just playing it safe. How do I then take that into my organization, into my team to help others feel safe enough to, to do the same? Yeah, great. So firstly, I would, I would introduce this concept of mouse naming. Brene Brown has a, a, a similar concept. She calls it rumbling. You know, in Dare to Lead, she says, okay, let's rumble, meaning we're going to get into it and, and it's gonna, it might be messy, but we're leaning into that. You can introduce this concept of mouse naming um, 
easiest thing is have everybody read the book. But if you just say, let, you know, what if we were more transparent and bring this idea to your team? In fact, a great question to ask the team is, what would make it safer for everyone in this room to say what's really going on for them? It could be something personal, it could be a desire they have in their work, something they're tolerating in the work. What would make it safer? I love that. That was an exercise in Dare to Lead. Have everyone write down on a piece of paper. So people are starting to think about what it would look like to be more revealed. And then there are questions that you can ask to, to bring out other people's mice. So you, you may have heard of this, John, the start, stop, continue questions. Uh, just if, if you say you wanted feedback on your own leadership, ask, ask people directly, What's something I should continue doing? What's something I should start doing? What's something I should stop doing? I coached one VP who wanted his meetings to be more dynamic. After the meeting, people were kind of like, oh, thank God that's over. And so he wanted to change it up. Now, we had some ideas on the call, but the main one was go and ask people, what do you want out of the meetings? What are your desires? And tell them why you're doing it. That's huge. That's your desire mouse. Name your why. I want these to be dynamic. I want to leave the meeting feeling pumped up. How about you guys? And then they came up with a new model for the meeting, which included accountability and celebrations. And then they decided they were going to pilot it for two weeks. Now, he kind of wanted to do all that anyway, but they created it together. And you could bring transparency into it. You could have a round of mouse naming at the top of the meetings. All right, mice, the name, what do we got? Any, any, any gripes, any requests, any desires? Appreciation mice are amazing. Appreciations, let's do it, let's have a round. You can build that into your meetings. If you're not doing it, I hope you're now thinking, why don't we do that? <laughs> why don't we have a round of appreciations at the beginning of every meeting and at the end of every meeting? Appreciation mice. I think those are, are some great points and some good food for thought. And I think there, there, uh, there's many ways we can go about creating a psychologically safe organizational culture and team dynamic. Uh, and ultimately, I think that's, that's the bottom line. Uh, show gratitude to each other, make people see, feel seen, heard, valued, um, give people the chance to contribute, uh, even when it may be a little bit uncomfortable. The more safety, psychological safety we can establish in the team, I think the greater the chance that people are going to be willing to put their necks out on the line a little bit and not play it safe. Yeah, well, and then I just realized like a lot of what we've been talking about is out there in the world. So away from me as a leader and what I can do for the team and with the team and like that, let's bring it back. This is an amazing leadership move. Bring it back to ourselves. And that's where mouse in the room really shines. So as a leader, the best way you can bring transparency and courage into the culture of your team or your company is by modeling it. You show the way. You be the change you want to see in the world. So if you notice you have something that's not working for you, find a way to artfully name that. Hey, this isn't working for me. This is what I do want. How do we create that? And here's why I want to, want to go there. So if you can keep modeling, oh, you know what? That meeting felt off for me. Or, hey, I noticed I'm, I'm starting to feel my energy drop. We've been on this. We're, we're 10 minutes over what we said we were going to do. How's everyone else's energy? The more you can name the truth and what's happening, the more people will trust you things start to change in the room and you become the leader that people want to follow because you're naming it. That's your job. It's also the job of comedians, by the way. That's, I just realized that's what they do for a living. They name the truth. And then we laugh because, because we, we recognize it. Leaders have to do that too. If you don't name what's actually happening, oh my God, goodness, you're no longer in reality with people and it's just weird the reason it doesn't seem weird is because everyone else is doing it but if you become one of those people that says the truth i just heard the saddest question i think i've ever heard 
yesterday on an interview. And the question was, how well do you need to know someone? What world are we living in that, we, that that's actually a valid question? And I'm here to say, you can actually tell the truth in any situation. There may be 10% of those situations, I would say, don't do it. Not a lot of upside. Downside's too high. Okay, don't do it. But 90% of the time, even if it's someone you just met, there is a way to be real and, to, and, and also to be appropriate. There's a way to do it. David, this has just been such a fun conversation. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your book, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. You can find the book at mouseintheroom.com. There's no the in front of it. We just kept it short, Mouse in the Room. There'll be a link to Amazon uh, and there'll be, uh, we'll show you how to get the bonuses that we've set up for the launch. And, uh, you know, buy multiple copies. If Sure, get a copy for you. But I promise you, mouse naming is so much easier if your family, your kids, your, your co-workers, your boss, if they're also naming mice, it's a lot easier. And it's going to help us reach the bestseller list. So that's my, my desire, mouse. My goal is to start a mouse naming revolution. I want to shift the culture so kids are going to their parents saying, mommy, can I name a mouse with you? People are going in, into the boardroom saying, all right, let me name a mouse up front. That's what I want to see happen. And if you also want to see that happen, help us make some noise on Amazon and reviews. Once, of course, you've gotten the book and read it. And if you think it deserves it, reviews help it climb in the rankings. And I have a desire mouse for a lot of really awesome reviews on Amazon. Mouseintheroom.com. <laughs> Wonderful. David, it has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what David can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen Organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors 
of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.